archaeology, I thought that archaeology was about the past. Over the years, I've come to learn that archaeology, and especially archaeological remains, are much more about the present. And I've also come to learn that actually our past is one of the great resources that we have for building a better future. When I was a, a student, I thought that archaeology was really about finding objective methods, that it was finding, that it was about scientific technologies that I could apply, and by doing so, I could sort of create a harmless and scientific and objective past that was behind us, that was static. But over the years, I've learned that even though we can, in archaeology, we have some objective methods, like carbon dating, and we can measure things, we can measure the provenance of artifacts, see where they are from, we can compare things in a computer. But all these objective scientific facts, facts in the end need an archaeologist, a person, to connect the dots. It needs someone to build a story, to write a history. And because this is dependent on persons, it means that different persons will create different stories. And that says something much more about the people in the present who write these stories than about the people in the past. Take the example of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, where different, um, where the, one of the three major religions in the world come together in one place. They all have their heritage, so to speak, on the same spot. Judaism, Christianity, Islam. If I would take three archaeologists with the same education, with the same techniques, in the same excavation, and they excavate the same layers. Then, and after that, I ask them to make an exhibition about what they found. You will get probably three very different stories. It's also not difficult to imagine that these stories have an impact on present day life. The question of who owns the past, the ownership of the past, has an impact upon, um, upon the lives of people in the present. Who was where first? To whom belongs this piece of land? Whose culture is this and who isn't? To the extreme, when you take archaeological heritage, um, these different views on the past and the political uses of the past can lead to, for instance, the destruction of uh, not only of heritage but also of the, the legacy of people. This is on, the, on your right, you see the what used to be the greatest Buddha statue in the world in the Bambian Valley in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. But this was destroyed by the Taliban about 10 years ago to wipe away the cultural memory, memory of other peoples because it didn't fit their beliefs. So that's the result on the left. If you want to understand a little bit more about why archaeological heritage has this present and political dimension to it, you have to go back to the history of archaeology itself. Archaeology grew as a discipline probably about 17, 1800s, mainly in Europe. It was about gentleman researchers who went away to study the classic remains, to study to see the, the biblical times, or to go to faraway countries, for instance, the countries of the former colonies of the European countries, to see what the remains of these people were. And because they not only dressed really good, perhaps better than I, which means that they were children of that time, but they were also children of that time in the sense that they looked upon other people's cultures in a different way than we do today. A lot of the archaeological stories that were written in this time were entrenched with colonialism. Sometimes they sought to sort of seek a clarification why Western European powers were more advanced than others. Some sense they clearly used archaeology to sort of claim dominion. This is the site of Great Zimbabwe in the southern Africa. It's one of the biggest archaeological sites that we have there. This shows this example. Archaeologists in the 20s and 30s, when they encountered this, they said, this is the product of a less advanced culture than ourselves. I quote, it's the product of an infantile mind. This says something much more about the remains and the cultures of the past, but it says much more about the people looking at this. Interestingly, about 50, 60 years later, during the Rhodesian regime, 
a predominantly white regime. They used the same archaeological site to tell a different story. They said, this is an, so advanced, this site, it is so fantastic, it can never have been built by the black community. It must have been built by foreign, perhaps white, civilization, which shows that we are the legacy of that, and we bring, in the same line, we bring also civilization to this, to this country. So you can see that archaeology is actually very much, because of its subjectivity, especially archaeological heritage, is very much dependent upon the present and upon politics. Another example, we go through all the great enlightened minds. Saddam Hussein used the site of Babylon to reconstruct palaces on the same spot where the ancient Babylon would be. He, he put his own image there, and by doing so, he used archaeology to claim, to seek justification for his rule in the same line as the ancient Babylonian, even Sumerian kings 4,000 years ago. So he placed himself in that same line of successors by doing so, using archaeology to justify um, his rule. A couple of years later, other people came to the same site. Babylon might have had a military value, but it also by many was seen as an ideological value. The, so, some people even spoke about Bush in Babylon, or the recolonization of Iraq, claiming ancient Babylon for Western civilization, perhaps. On an interesting side note, what most people don't know is that the gate, the Ishtar gate that you see, is actually a fake, because 100 years before that, the Germans had already taken it from Babylon, and it's now in a Berlin museum. <laughs> so, in order to deal with this contested heritage, and in order to sort of transcend the problems and to make sure that things are not destroyed, We've had many, since the 70s, many organizations and laws like, and international organizations like UNESCO, who have tried to put a different spin on it. They said, well, actually our heritage is so important that we should speak about the heritage of humankind, world heritage, we all know it. This, village, this heritage is so important that it is of universal value. And even though UNESCO has had many successes, um, in creating awareness about the value of our past, in preserving sites, attracting tourism, something went slightly wrong, and they are aware of that, I must say. This is a distribution of all the world heritage in the world. Some of you might think, well, yeah, it's obvious we have a lot of heritage in Europe. <laughs> but probably what you see here is much more a result of these Western roots of heritage and archaeology. This says something about who decides what heritage is and who decides and who has the power to put forward things for the nomination. It was these kind of thoughts that, I, that struck me when I was excavating in Syria uh, about 12 years ago, which I showed you on the first slide. Back then I thought, I need to think again. What am I doing here? Why does a boy born in Heerenveen, in Friesland, go all the way to another people's country to investigate their culture? Well, think again. How would you feel, how would we feel, if Syrian archaeologists came to excavate the Hunebedden in Drenthe? It's what we do. What if they excavated this, put a little rope around it, maybe take away some artifacts, some data, publish in it in Arabic, perhaps even translate it? Wouldn't we be curious what happened to this heritage? Wouldn't we be curious to know what they wrote about us? This bog body that probably most of you know, the Meisje van Ide, the girl of Ide, 
perhaps she's not the most pretty girl, but she's ours. And what if she was actually not in a museum in Drenthe, but in a museum in Africa? Would we want her back? Is she our ancestor that needs to be reclaimed? So over the years, myself and other archaeologists have come to realize that we have to look much more critically on our own role in investigating the past. We have to be much more sort of move away from this scientific, objective, universal view and give much more emphasis on the local value and the fact that different people have different meanings. And we have to look at the, the history of our own investigations of the past. One example, I think, what we, what we can do is that we stop seeing human remains as scientific data in archaeology. Maybe what for us is scientific data that is in a university or a museum is somebody's grandparents or great-great-great-grandparents, and we have to re repatriate them and reburial, uh, uh, rebury them. This is an example of an indigenous community where archaeologists have exactly returned ancient remains and they are relaying them to rest in the earth according to their own belief systems. These kind of initiatives are not just good for sort of rewriting some of the wrongs in the past, but they can really function as a form for dialogue between different cultures and conflicts. Because of this ambiguity in the past, it's a really good resource for <coughs> creating dialogue. This is another interesting example. These are some representatives of Maori tribesmen in the canals in Leiden. A few years before that, Leiden, the National Museum of Ethnography in Leiden decided to return some of the ancient remains and artifacts. And in response, a couple of years later, they came back to Leiden to willingly give something back. It's another way how, how it can be done. But it also creates the opportunity for dialogue. And interestingly, we learned a lot about this, not just about the differences between ownership of the past, but also about what heritage is. They learned us that this canoe, this waka, actually shouldn't be preserved according to their views by some scientific methods, or that it should be seen as a dead static piece of archaeology. They said it is a living thing, it is alive, and it needs spiritual dance and songs to keep it alive. That's how we should preserve it. If we would put that emphasis on UNESCO World Heritage, we would, we would see a very different kind of distribution. Another thing that archaeologists have tried to do, which I'm involved with, is <coughs> trying to give the archaeological tools to communities around the world so that they can write their own histories. A lot of communities, minority groups, um, indigenous peoples, their histories are ignored, maybe written by somebody else, perhaps even oppressed. If we give them the tools to sort of write their own archaeology, to write their own stories, it can really help them in moving forward and creating a cultural identity. And this is the site of Tel Balata in the West Bank, where I work. This site was excavated by the Germans, the Americans, even the Dutch in the last century. And all of the data is spread all over the world in different library books. A lot of the artifacts are spread all over the world. What we try to do is to actually, instead of excavating something new, we try to reclaim all of these information and all of the knowledge. We also try to, re to reclaim the site, restore the site, and by doing so you can effectively almost, well, perhaps give back some of the history to the people who, who live there. By doing so you can also do something else. We are also building a local museum there to attract tourism to a region that can really use it. So in this sense, archaeology can very practically also help people in the present. We do that not only by focusing upon the capacity and working together with archaeologists from the Palestinian department, but also with children. Let children excavate themselves, they love it. Um, but I think it's really important to instill this idea that the value is not just something far away or, or scary, but actually is something that is, that is ambiguous, but it can also be used for good. It's a very important message for children. They can learn about different peoples and different belief systems in a constructive way. 
A final example is a project by a colleague of mine in Jordan. He investigates ancient Roman water systems. Not just, not just for the sake of it, because he believes that the ideas behind this technology can be reapplied in the arid desert in, uh, in Jordan. So this might be a project for uh, up as well. He believes that by using the ancient ideas and the, um, applying the, the simple tools that are available, you can bring back irrigation to regions that need it, not by expensive um, measures. For me, a lot of these initiatives come together in a foundation in which I'm also involved with, Gold Common Sites. And we work with some of the organizations that you heard about in the last talk, because we also believe that new technology and communication can actually turn the thing around. Perhaps by using new technology, we can make sure that local communities around the world ask us well, what kind of project and what kind of archaeology they want. They say, we want this to be investigated, can you please help us? And then archaeologists might pop in and some people might donate money. If you do that, you just turn the whole system because normally it's me sitting behind a desk in Leiden University thinking, where shall I go and investigate things? So, to sum it all up, I think that if we all free our minds of the idea that the past an archaeological past is something static or dead, or something that is behind us. If we free our mind of that concept, and actually that we realize that the past is all around us, constantly, it shapes our everyday life. We live constantly among the remains of the past. It's so obvious that we just forget it. But if we do that, then I think if we realize that, that can we, uh, we can truly see the, the value of the past. And it's only up to us to decide how we give it a better future.